Good evening and welcome back to the Washington Outsider Report on the Coalition Radio. With you today, as always, is the Editor-in-Chief of the Washington Outsider, that's me, Irina Zuckerman, and our special guest today is Adike Rashkov. Uh, he is a senior uh, senior reporter on national security and strategic affairs um, in India. Uh, he is here uh, to discuss uh, a couple of not at all controversial topics, um, such as uh, Pakistan's alleged backing of extremists that are uh, starting restarting Kashmir related campaigns, as well as recent media a series of, uh, of articles that appeared in the US media claiming that uh, Hindu extremists are planning a possibility of an anti Muslim genocide in India that Prime Minister Modi should be doing more about it. We'll discuss all of that with IDK today. Uh, before we get into these topics, uh, Aditya, please tell us a little bit more about yourself, your background, how you came to specialize in these security matters. Well, Arena, thank you so much for having me here. Such a pleasure uh, talking to you and that too, about a topic that's very close to my heart, that is Kashmir. So uh, my journey from Kashmir began uh, somewhere about 1990, when we were forced, uh, my family and uh, several others, thousands of them uh, from the minority Hindu community were forced out. And that was due to Pakistan-sponsored terrorism. Our houses were gutted. Uh, leaders, politicians, poets, uh, scholars were brutally killed in a selective targeted campaign uh, by Pakistani Islamist terrorists. And this happened all across the Kashmir Valley in the 1990s. So the media wasn't as active, the international media or the national media. There wasn't any kind of you know, social media active at that time. And there wasn't any kind of, uh, of course, the TV channels, the TV news was also not 24 seven. So there's hardly any recorded evidence, very few primary sources coming forward in the form of books or very minuscule uh, you know, amount of literature that really tells us the gory tale of the Kashmiri Pandit community uh, you know, from where I belong, uh, actually migrated out from Kashmir and are now scattered not just across India, but all across the globe. So. I was born and risen uh, in that conflict environment. We spent time in a refugee camp in our own country in India, in, in, in Jammu, uh, in sweltering heat. I've stayed in a garage uh, or a cow shed, so as to say, for some time when I was really young. And then we moved to Delhi. And even as our house was gutted in Kashmir, uh, my family started from scratch uh, in New Delhi, India's national capital, and uh, life began. And gradually, uh, you know, through my years, uh, looking at the hardships of my family, looking at Kashmir very closely because there was a sense of longing to return home someday. Uh, I began researching a little more about Kashmir, reading much more about it. And at the same time, uh, looking at other conflicts, what's happening in Israel, what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, or North Korea, South Korea, or other uh, different conflicts all across the globe. And that's how my reportage began almost uh, 14 years, 15 years ago on national security and uh, foreign affairs. I worked with uh, uh, three of the most uh, watched Indian uh, national news channels, Times Now, uh, Republic TV, and CNN News 18, where I work currently. Um, and uh, of course, I've been reporting continuously. I've reported from other conflicts all across the globe as well. But Kashmir is something, Pakistan is something that I've been focused on very closely. And I have reported from there uh, continuously over the years. Now, at the time, uh, at the time these events happened, Kashmir was being disputed. But what happened since then, and what is the situation currently? Well, situation in Kashmir isn't as bad as it was in 1990, or it was, uh, you know, perhaps five to ten years ago. Uh, I would say it has calmed down to a great extent. But that does not mean the terrorism or the radicalization or the violence has ended. So at this moment, of course, we'll have to go to the historical context of how uh, the treaty of accession was signed between the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, who was Hari Singh, who belonged to the Dogra Hindu community. And he uh, signed this with India uh, and said that, you know, the Indian troops should come to rescue uh, Jammu and Kashmir at the time when the Pakistani Kabali raiders uh, were plundering the lands and were raping women and were absolutely gone on a mayhem 
as they entered from the Pakistani side towards the north of Kashmir, towards Paramulla. And, uh, of course, the treaty accession was signed. The Indian army and the Indian troops moved in. And since then, of course, Jammu and Kashmir, of course, which had historical, cultural, traditional uh, links with India already, uh, became not just geographically, but politically, uh, a very integral part of India as per the accession. But there was, of course, Pakistan, which did not want uh, this to happen. And it said that Jammu and Kashmir is the Muslim majority uh, state, the only Muslim majority state in India. And that's why it was more uh, suited to be with Pakistan. That's what Pakistan said. And uh, over the years, there was a minuscule minority of Islamist radicals who grew in number more recently in the last uh, three to four decades, who also said that, yes, we either want to go with Pakistan or we want some kind of a secession, really, you know, outside an independent country. And ever since 1986, 87 and 1990 saw a full blown uh, campaign, there was violence against the minorities, uh, the Kashmiri Pandit or the Kashmiri Hindu community, who were very few in number, but were known as people who were very educated, who were teachers, who were scholars, who were scientists in Kashmir. And on 19 January 1990, there was a brutal exodus, which is compared with Holocaust. And on every 19 January ever since, there is a Holocaust day or the exodus day that is marked by the Kashmiri Hindu community all across India and the world. And uh, hundreds of Kashmiri Hindus were killed. Uh, there were pogroms and of course carnages that happened even after that uh, in several areas of Kashmir where Pakistani terror organizations including Hizbul Mujahideen and lashkar e toiba were involved and uh, you know children were not spared women were not spared and they were brutally brutally murdered in in villages of Kashmir in cities of Kashmir in in the dead of the night uh, I mean there are several examples to quote from Sangrampura to Nadimar to Ghul uh, to, uh, you know, in Anantnag, Srinagar, and different other districts of Kashmir. So if you ask me the present situation, uh, a lot has happened. And, you know, I can go on and on about it. But in the current circumstances, what we do need to realize that the government of the day in India has abrogated Article 370. And Article 370, decades ago, gave a special status to Jammu and Kashmir, which said that there, are, there were certain laws uh, that were independent to Jammu and Kashmir. And the central government or the federal government will not have any kind of control over it. So on 5th of August, 2019, the abrogation of, 90, uh, abrogation of Article 370 happened. Uh, the Parliament of India bought, brought a bill which said that Jammu and Kashmir will be an integral part of India. All the central laws will be applied there equally as per other states of the country. And there won't be any kind of a special status uh, which already gives them you know, separatist tendencies and uh, you know, these Islamist radicals get more momentum because of it. So this will be completely taken away. So 5th of August, 2019, that happened. And ever since, drastically, we've seen, seen that the violence and terrorism has come down. As I said, it does not mean that terrorism, radicalization, violence has completely been eradicated, but statistics speaks for themselves, speak for themselves. And there's been a drastic change. Uh, but Pakistan-sponsored terrorism continues, and we've seen the state of Pakistan as well. So as of now, the current situation, what I'll tell you, is still not great. I was in Kashmir in July for a month. I was traveling all across the Kashmir Valley. What I saw was that it will, be, it will take a lot of time for peace to be restored, but that will need consistent action from government of India and of course, from people in Kashmir as well, who now want to you know, explore uh, in different areas towards development, progress, you know, jo better job opportunities, education. And that's what they feel that, you know, the government of India also needs to do much more uh, for people at the grassroots level in Kashmir to get the benefits. And of course, uh, who have survived the conflict over the last three decades and want uh, to come out of it. There's a fatigue factor as well. They're tired of conflict. They're tired of seeing blood and killings happening on all sides. And they want to get over it. I think that that's that's the sentiment, the sentiment that does not really get through in a lot of the very admittedly very limited coverage about this issue. Uh, yeah. There was a a spark. There was a campaign around the abrogation of the of the um of that article that you mentioned, the, the article three seventy in two thousand nineteen, and following this blast of 
outrage and, and outrageous information that uh, essentially claimed that Kashmir was basically almost an independent state that was being forcefully annexed. That was the actual the 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 the, uh, the level of coverage that was given to to the United States. Um, since then, not much has been uh, reported in the media. Um, in general, uh, it's been focused on other conflicts around the world, and uh, this, uh, there is this tendency to conflict jump from one controversy to another without really staying long enough to see to see through what actually happens in the long run uh, with the West, and that creates a very uneven understanding of situations. And needless to say. Um, my my question is as follows i think some of the you know in the united states or and around the world the audiences are familiar with the muslim brotherhood with the uh, kind of uh, arab islamists that uh, that have influenced other movements uh around the world they're less familiar with pakistan-backed groups and uh, you know everyone's heard of al-qaeda isis and uh, you know even taliban who are the extremists that we are talking about that um, that have been based in Kashmir? You know, a very interesting question, and there are two parts to the question. One is, of course, the uh, vociferous campaign of the Western press uh, to, in fact, report on Kashmir because they uh, almost romanticize with the idea of separatism in the Kashmir Valley. And when I speak of the Western press, I talk about New York Times, I talk about Washington Post, I talk about BBC, Al Jazeera who vehemently will report in the garb of human interest story about how uh, you know, those people who support Islamist terrorism in Kashmir are suffering, are actually suffering. But they will not report about the minorities you know, in the Kashmir Valley who have suffered for the last three decades. They will also not report on what happened on 5th August 2019 was not taking away the rights, was in fact restoring equality between Jammu and Kashmir and the rest of the states of India. They will not, these Western press will also not report about the caste system, unfortunately, in India that has divided the society over decades and decades. And while there is now some sense of equality, and of course, there are laws and constitution that everybody respects, but Article 370 was against uh, a community of Dalits uh, who were known as Valmikis in Jammu and Kashmir, who were basically, what I'll try to explain you, they were sweepers. They were sanitization workers, and they did not get any kind of rights by the Jammu and Kashmir government because of Article 370 and 35A. I mean, this is horrific. I mean, how can you imagine that while the Western press will report about any such instance all across India, that when uh, uh, people from a certain caste are discriminated upon, if there's a higher caste which is discriminating against lower caste, if there is some kind of a violence, if there is a class status, uh, given to others, but not them. They will report on that. But when it comes to Jammu and Kashmir, suddenly the rules change. The Valmikis, the Dalits, who suffered because of Article 370, was certainly not reported. And I'll tell you, uh, as I explained, you know, many decades ago, these Valmikis and Dalits had come from Punjab, the state of Punjab, to Jammu and Kashmir. And their families over the last many decades settled there. But they did not become citizens of Jammu and Kashmir. And for that reason, uh, the law, Article 370 and 35A, said that uh, these people will continue to be sanitization workers. I mean, not just that. The most preposterous part comes now. Their children, their sons and daughters, will also be sweepers, sanitization workers, and they will not get jobs in any other field in Jammu and Kashmir. They cannot become scientists. They cannot become engineers. They cannot become doctors. They will not get any kind of a such position in Jammu and Kashmir, and they will only be sweepers and sanitization workers and be on the roads with, uh, you know, broom in their hand. Can you imagine? Such was the level of discrimination. And I have seen on 5th August 2019 the kind of tears that this community of Dalits and Valmikis had. And we didn't see New York Times or BBC do human interest stories on them, of their suffering, of the hegemony of a certain class of people in Kashmir unfortunately Muslim, uh, who actually said that, no, we are the rulers here and everything will go by us. Now, can you imagine, uh, India is a secular country, India, India is a secular democracy. In our constitution, which was uh, the drafting committee chairperson was B.R. Ambedkar, a very well-known leader who's respected widely across India. 
uh, and it was for equality, justice. As I said, it was a secular demo democracy. So all religions are treated equally. It's not an Islamist nation like Pakistan. We are not an Islamic republic, but we are a democratic republic. And in Jammu and Kashmir, unfortunately, in these last 70, 75 years, there's not been a single non-Muslim chief minister. Can you imagine that? Why are minorities not given space? Why are Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, uh, other you know, bio, border minorities uh, who are even Muslims, uh, you know, Bakarwals, uh, who are basically shepherds and others in Jammu and Kashmir are just not treated equally. It's almost like Pakistan. You know, Pakistan, as per the constitution, can only have a Muslim prime minister. It cannot have a non-Muslim prime minister or a ruler. And similar was the case with 370 and all these laws. So there's been a lot of discrimination over the years, which strangely the Western press just forgets. Now, I'll come to the main question that you asked about the extremist groups. Uh, you know, of course, again, we'll have to go to the history of how you know, elections happened in the late 80s in Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, there was a particular uh, party, Muslim United Front, which said that there was rigging in the elections. And the National Conference, which is an age-old party of Jammu and Kashmir, a great legacy of Sheikh Abdullah and then Farooq Abdullah, and of course, uh, Omar Abdullah's son, all have been chief ministers of Jammu and Kashmir. And the dynasty has really continued. And in the late 80s, the Muslim United Front that contested against national conference and other national political parties said that there was rigging in the elections. We would have won, but the national conference somehow got through. And they decided that we do not have any kind of belief now in the Indian uh, you know, constitution or the Indian democracy. So we will pick up the gun. So... Uh, one of the leaders of Muslim United Front was uh, Sayyid Salahuddin. And uh, his polling agent was a person named Yasin Malik. Sayyid Salahuddin, along with the support of Pakistan, created one of the most uh, radical and Islamist terror organization called Hezbul Mujahideen. And he crossed the border and stayed uh, in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir ever since 89-90. His polling agent, Yasin Malik, stayed in Srinagar, but he created a separatist group which was initially a terror group known as Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front. And both these, Hezbollah Mujahideen and uh, Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front, had recruited men in Kashmir, brainwashed them. Uh, there was immense level of indoctrination. And this happened in POK, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. All of these men from Srinagar through the North Kashmir route uh, went to Pakistan. They got arms training from the Pakistan Army and the Pakistan ISI supported them. They gave them money as well. And finally, they came back uh, in late 89, early 90 uh, to Kashmir and not just killed the minority Kashmiri pundits, but they also attacked the security forces from the army, from the CRPF and from the Jammu and Kashmir police. Also, the prominent Kashmiri Muslims who were seen as faces of India in Kashmir, who were seen as representing Indian democracy in Kashmir were also targeted. So it was a systematic campaign uh, which continued for a few years and there was immense level of, you know, basic carnage that happened. So these were the two groups that really started this you know, momentum of killing people, fear psychosis being built on the streets of Srinagar. And can you imagine in 1990, January, there were actually slogans uh, from the mosques in the Kashmir Valley, uh, which said that you know, the minority Kashmiri pundits should leave, but they should leave behind their women and they should stay with us. And this was the level of indoctrination and you know, the criminality uh, level of them. Through the years, uh, after a decade or so, there were other groups that actually took center stage. One such group was of a terrorist known as Maulana Masood Azhar, who is the chief of a very, very radical uh, terrorist organization called jaish e Mohammed. Now, jaish e Mohammed, lashkar e Toiba, and Hezbollah Mujahideen are also UN-designated organizations. They are also US-designated terror organizations. So, they have a bounty on their head, all the chiefs of these terror organizations, but still Pakistan has not acted on them. So uh, I don't know if you would know, but uh, in the late 90s, Maulana Masood Azhar was actually arrested by the Indian security forces when he intruded into India and was trying to stay in Kashmir and actually along with other uh, OGWs, which are the overground workers of terror organizations, uh, plan some kind of a carnage or terror attack. He was arrested. He was kept in the Kot Palwal jail in Jammu and Kashmir. And um, I think it was 1998 when uh, 
actually uh, the icj uh, ic uh, 814 hijacking took place from nepal uh, one of the you know indian uh, airlines flights was actually hijacked by pakistani terrorists of jaish e mohammed and uh, they of course had support from the al qaeda and taliban as well and uh, this flight that was uh, that had taken off from nepal actually landed in new delhi and then actually uh, went of course to uh, amritsar in the state of punjab and finally to pakistan and um, of course through dubai and some other route to kandahar in afghanistan so this flight uh, actually got support of course from the taliban at that particular time and others and in exchange after the negotiations that happened that was led by ajit doval who is india's national security advisor at this particular time he was with the intelligence bureau of india at that time uh, molana masood azhar uh, and a few other terrorists were released uh, in negotiations and all the passengers were released but one of the passengers was killed mr katyal and uh, thus began another campaign of jaish e mohammed jaish e mohammed actually started a massive terror camp in a place called balakot in pakistan and more recently in the year 2019 you would have heard uh, that uh, there were attacks by pakistan of course in pulwama in south kashmir where 40 of the indian security forces were killed and in revenge uh, to respond to pakistan's carnage of, of jaish e mohammed india actually sent the indian air force jets inside pakistan and hit balakot which is of course known as one of the headquarters of jaish e mohammed so i would say jaish e mohammed lashkar e toiba and of course hizbul mujahideen are the main terror organizations but there have been others including al badar uh, ansar gazwatul hind Uh, ISIS, uh, of course, motivated few people, not majorly, but to a certain extent, uh, was active in Kashmir as well. So, Lashkar e Toiba also has uh, changed its names several times because of the UN designation, and its chief is known as Hafiz Said. Uh, there are others, key terrorists involved with them, uh, who are of course based in Lahore and few other areas in Pakistan. Uh, Masood Azhar, of course, primarily has been in Peshawar. you would have heard of course of the 2611 attacks that are often compared with the 911 in us and the 2611 was the handiwork of the lashkar e toiba in pakistan where ajmal kasab and few other terrorists were actually intruded into india so through a sea route and in mumbai uh, more than uh, 200 to 300 people i think 360 uh, six people were actually killed of different nationalities including indians americans israeli uh, citizens as well and uh, of course at that time there wasn't any kind of a major military reaction that india did there were uh, possibilities india did consider possibilities but then decided not to go through so these terror organizations have continued to have major terror strikes all across india uh, from pulwama to shopian to dina nagar to uh, pathan court to uri to nagrota you know different areas of jammu and kashmir and punjab where this happened but india's internal security dynamics have also changed drastically over the years so now we see uh, these terror organizations mostly restricted to jammu and kashmir while they do try uh, to disturb peace in different indian states including uttar pradesh uh, new delhi uh, and of course punjab but more so they have been restricted to jammu and kashmir now at least in the last i would say 5 to 10 years what are their current goals what are they trying to achieve given the fact that the issue has been politically resolved and it it would seem that uh, they outlook the usefulness well uh, firstly you know personally if you ask me i don't see jammu and kashmir as a political issue i see this as a uh, an issue of terrorism of course there are political negotiations that need to take place for peace to finally achieve between india and pakistan it's a bilateral issue but when this will happen how this will happen is a long story there have been several attempts that have been made there was uh, an agra summit that happened where parvez musharraf had come there was of course the bus route that was taken between uh, you know lahore and amritsar uh, in between india and pakistan where the indian prime minister atul bihari vajpayee actually visited lahore in pakistan more recently uh, we have seen the indian prime minister narendra modi when he was visiting afghanistan uh, for his official visit on his return he made a very surprise visit to pakistan and attended one of the uh, you know uh, family weddings of the nawaz sharif family 
when Nawaz Sharif was the prime minister. So there have been some peace efforts that have happened. Uh, of course, track two dialogue also between India and Pakistan is currently ongoing. Uh, over the last one year, there has been some progress that's been made uh, in the form of a ceasefire. Now, ceasefire between India and Pakistan arrived in the year 2003. Uh, a ceasefire formal agreement was reached in which it was said that, you know, the Indian troops and the Pakistani troops at the international border in Jammu and Kashmir will have uh, no shooting at each other. Uh, the ceasefire agreement will be respected. But in a few years, we saw continuous firing happening from the Pakistani side, which of course India responded to. And there was continuous firing between each other in which unfortunately, the local civilians got caught up several times and the civilians on both sides of the border um, died. Their properties were also destroyed at several times. So uh, since a year, thankfully we haven't seen any kind of a firing happening. So the locals are very happy, at least in the border areas, to say that while the Pakistani army is very uh, strongly positioned there, the Indian army is also strongly positioned at the in, uh, international border, but uh, the firing has stopped. So we see an, that's, there is a little glimmer of hope uh, that there might be. A very prominent speaker in Pakistan recently had said, that if Imran Khan and the deep state of Pakistan really want, then of course peace can happen and peace can be achieved and including on Jammu and Kashmir because most of the Pakistani leaders and their military say that there's only one contentious issue between these two countries, which is Jammu and Kashmir. And there's no other issue because uh, we are the same people. We have the same genes. We have perhaps even the same culture and traditions. Uh, we perhaps eat the same sweets and same food as well. Uh, but when it comes to Jammu and Kashmir, there's a very rigid, very emotional uh, divide uh, that happens not just, you know, at the border, but you should see the social media, you know, between the Indians and the Pakistanis, whenever there is anything that uh, comes from, on Jammu and Kashmir, etc. There are very harsh reactions that happen on both sides of the border. So at this moment, uh, politically, I don't see much movement happening because there are elections in Pakistan. And whenever there are elections, there's a lot of rhetoric. Uh, that happens through the campaigning and it's both in india and pakistan i'll be i'll give you a very neutral perspective that you know whenever elections happen in india uh, pakistan is abused like anything and actually political leaders in india win elections if they abuse pakistan as much as possible and the pakistani rhetoric is at its peak and there's a similar situation and perhaps much more in pakistan because pakistan as compared to india is much smaller and uh, there are Islamists, there are radicals that are much more in number in Pakistan. And whenever there are elections uh, in Pakistan, we see the anti-India rhetoric at its peak. And of course, it's a known fact that any political party which is close to the Pakistani deep state, which is the Pakistan army, actually takes control. And the real uh, you know, power center in Pakistan is actually Rawal Pindi and Aadpara. Rawal Pindi being the headquarters of the Pakistan army and Aadpara being the headquarters of the Pakistan ISI. So it is, in effect, the Pakistan army, which is uh, driving not just uh, the military part of the campaign in Pakistan, but they are also uh, looking at the political uh, you know, things and taking calls on all important issues. So I would say a political dialogue is a far-fetched thought at this moment, at least between these two countries, but track two level dialogue in which uh, prominent, uh, I would say, international relations experts, even journalists or others have been meeting. There have been uh, campaigning either in Thailand or in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, or several other places. There have been such meetings organized that some kind of a consensus really happens. Uh, in the past, we saw, uh, you know, the Indian National Security Advisor meeting the Pakistani National Security Advisor, but this was also a few years ago. There were a few meetings happen, a couple of meetings at least, that happened between them. But again, we are, uh, again, back to square one between these two countries because of the recent bitter experiences of Pulwama terror attack, thereafter the Balakot attack, and uh, people are very emotional at this point. And of course, of course after Article 370 abrogation uh, on 5th August 2019, Pakistan um, did campaign a lot all across the globe. They internationally went to all the countries, including the OIC and wanted some kind of a support at the international level. Unfortunately, they did not receive that. And so Pakistan does feel a little bit of an isolation on that front. They also thought that the UAE or the Saudi Arabia and Malaysia, Turkey and others will come to their rescue, at least diplomatically. But again, apart from some lip service statements, there wasn't much 
uh, that uh, came in for them. In fact, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Maldives uh, have much more better relations with India, uh, politically, trade-wise, uh, and uh, you know bilaterally, as compared to Pakistan. And lastly, you would know, of course, uh, the Financial Action Task Force, which has put uh, Pakistan on the gray list for at least last three years or more. Uh, that has been an economic challenge for Pakistan as well. And uh, there are fears that if Pakistan does not abide by all the principles uh, or the checklist that has been given by uh, the FATF, uh, then Pakistan could be landing up on a blacklist. And that means massive economic challenges, loans be not being granted by the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank. And of course, uh, the economy of Pakistan, which is already in shambles, uh, going for a toss. Uh, completely. So that's why I think uh, there is some realization, at least in a section of Pakistan army and the Pakistan political establishment, who want uh, some kind of a peace. I don't know if this is a temporary peace that they want, or they are actually serious, but they do realize that if they continue on the same path, which they are right now, then the economic challenges are not going to end. And of course, the US, which was very supportive, and almost had a very kind of a balanced approach towards India and Pakistan, seems to be changing that. It happened to a certain extent under the Trump era, but Trump also messed up towards the end. And Biden also doesn't seem to be very interested in Imran Khan because he has served as the vice president when Obama was the president. And he has seen how Pakistan has not changed the commitments that they gave. And lastly, of course, what happened, unfortunately, when Kabul fell, uh, the kind of commitments that Pakistan had made uh, completely were lost uh, in translation. It did not happen. So Pakistan uh, has unfortunately betrayed. That's the per perception right now in the national security in Washington, D.C. So they do not trust uh, Pakistan. There's a trust deficit. But how things evolve eventually is something we'll have to see. Uh, well, of course, I would... I would be remiss not to mention the role of China in all of this. Do you think Pakistan's growing financial dependency on China and growing relations will help stabilize in uh, the situation and help uh, with minimizing the funding of extremism? Or do you think they will exploit uh, having a new ally and kind of return to that, to that kind of mindset and that uh, track? Well, a very interesting and important question that we need to consider is, of course, the big elephant in the room, which is China. And uh, China, I would say, is a bully. And China has an expansionist tendency. And that's why we've seen uh, China not just towards its neighbors or countries in South Asia, but all across the globe, uh, from Djibouti to Maldives to Sri Lanka to Bangladesh and several other countries, and now, of course, Afghanistan under the Taliban. Uh, they want to have economic ties with them and make them surrender to uh, a debt trap, a debt trap which economically shatters these countries completely, and China has an upper hand. So China, what it did uh, a couple of years ago with India, uh, for the first time in 40 years, there were casualties between India and China at the border. Uh, there were clashes that happened in Galwan Valley on the eastern Ladakh. And um, we saw at least uh, 20 Indian soldiers uh, were killed. And this was not through bullets, but there were fist fights and physical violence that happened between Indian and Chinese uh, troops at such a height uh, in such a bitter weather uh, between these two nations. And um, so ever since we have seen India and China relations have gone down uh, south. and. Uh, Apart from that, Pakistan and China, of course, years ago came into an agreement on the CPEC, uh, the uh, you know the BRO agreement, in which a BRI agreement in which uh, there is a huge road on trade that uh, is facilitated between China and Pakistan. There's a huge money amounts of money that has gone from Pakistan to China, uh, from China to Pakistan, and we have seen uh, a realization in China as well that. Uh, how much they can use Pakistan. Uh, because, you know, this is a one-way street. It's a one-way payment that's going, uh, one-way development that's completely happening. How much will China benefit out of it is the real question. While India and China, uh, you know, relations have gone sour completely. And over the years, we've seen 
a tacit kind of an understanding between China and Pakistan, where China does not condemn Pakistan sponsored terrorism or radicalization, where Pakistan remains completely silent on what's happening in Hong Kong or with the Huger, uh, you know, genocide. It completely remains silent with uh, the kind of repression and atrocities that the Tibetans have been suffering, the monks who are now being uh, taken to camps, just like the Uyghurs. Uh, so Pakistan as an Islamic Republic that actually talks of blasphemy, talks of, uh, you know, strict action, if there is blasphemous action, does not say a word. In fact, Imran Khan has been questioned several times on the situation with Uyghur uh, in Chinese camps with the kind of genocide they suffer. Their religion is not being allowed to practice by China and same with Tibetans. And Pakistan has completely remained a mute uh, spectator. And Imran Khan has openly said that China is a dear friend. So we will not talk about these things in uh, public or on television. So uh, the hypocrisy really comes out in open. But we'll also have to see that Pakistan and, of course, China have been isolated because of this bullying nature and a tacit understanding between them. Of course, uh, you know, there's a group of countries that have, uh, you know, come together uh, on the Indian Ocean front on uh, countering the South China Sea uh, sure. and other aspects as well. There's a meeting that's happening uh, in less than, I think, 48 hours from now in Australia, where uh, people from Australia, Japan, India, uh, and US, of course, will come together and discuss this further. That has come as a very strong uh, message uh, and the world media's and attention and international relation attention is certainly on it. So I don't see uh, this as a major threat all across the globe, but of course, uh, we'll have to carefully observe uh, China uh, independently, you know, of its uh, basically not abiding by the rules-based order completely having a bullying nature towards its neighbors, the kind of debt trap that it is involving several countries into is something that is concerning. And now, of course, the latest is the pandemic as well, with several concerns on COVID-19 originating in Wuhan and uh, the kind of uh, approach that the World Health Organization initially had towards China completely rubbishing that uh, there could be a uh, people-to-people or human contact on COVID-19. Here we are with lakhs and uh, you know, thousands of people who have died, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. So China remains a global concern that we'll have to deal with. But I don't see this China-Pakistan relations working in favor of China for a very long time. There's a great security as well as intelligence uh, and political understanding between the Chinese leadership and, of course, uh, Pakistan. But Pakistan has been rebuked and Pakistan has suffered a lot uh, of humiliation at the hands of China as well. We've seen also the Chinese workers uh, continuously being attacked in Pakistan by rebel organizations from the Balochistan front, uh, from even in Pakistan occupied Kashmir. So uh, there is a lot of local uh, rebellion in Pakistan occupied Kashmir, in Balochistan, in Sindh, in Khyber Pakhtunwa as well. So I don't see a situation where the CPEC, the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, will be a safe bet long term for China because these rebel groups are completely uh, playing a havoc against China, Pakistan. And lastly, you've seen what happened recently in Balochistan. You've seen what happened in Noshki um, and uh, Panjgur, where the frontier core headquarters of Pakistan are in Balochistan. And after many years, there was a huge uh, attack by the Baloch rebels, by the Baloch uh, uh, Liberation Army. And they killed more than 25 uh, soldiers of the Pakistan army at the frontier core. So, uh, and this has led to the Pakistan army chief general Bajwa visiting Balochistan, perhaps first time in history, twice in a span of less than 10 days. So the concerns internally in their own backyard in Pakistan are something that they'll have to look into. But if you consider India and China, I don't see the relations really heading back to normalcy uh, anytime soon. There was of course, a lot of uh, long rope that India gave to China. We had the Chennai Connect where Xi Jinping visited Chennai. We had the Wuhan spirit that was spoken about when Prime Minister Narendra Modi went to Wuhan in China. But that seems to have gone south completely after the Galvan Valley clashes with uh, the soldiers dying. And interestingly, while India has paid tribute to the soldiers and it was the, their funerals were public, their names were public, they were awarded publicly, China still date hasn't announced the casualties in the Galvan clash. 
they only said that five of their soldiers killed and that too a year after the Galvan Valley clashes. So uh, they haven't uh, honored, they haven't respected uh, their soldiers. In fact, one of the Australian publications has recently said that more than 40 uh, Chinese PLA soldiers were killed in clashes with the Indian Army. Uh, and a uh, Russian publication, Russia, of course, being a very close ally of China as well, uh, had said, I think TASS had said that at least 44 uh, Chinese PLA soldiers were killed in the Galvan Valley clashes. So China, uh, you know, this is expected from them. They do not, uh, uh, you know, open up about the reality, especially if they are on a losing ground. And they are known for the information warfare, disinformation. They are known for this kind of a warfare over the internet, uh, elsewhere, where they want to, uh, you know, project a very different image and try to perhaps say that they are on an upper ground and they have hegemony. So I perhaps think that we'll have to closely monitor India and US specifically of China's games in this region and beyond. And certainly that will uh, pose a challenge in future. Well, at the very least, it's obvious that China is not going to be helpful with the de-radicalization and counter-extremism. There are many voices in the West who think that China for all its other uh, shortcomings uh, is somehow a beacon of stability in conflicts, which is, I do not see to be the case. And everything you're telling me right now shows that at the very least it will not interfere, if not outright enable its proxies and its partners whenever, you know, whenever it is in its interest to do so. And now shifting back from these external affairs to a more uh, internal issues. Uh, we have seen a number of major publications within weeks of each other in the West publish um, rather, uh, rather alarming in tone articles concerning India's internal relations between its Hindu pop population and Muslims saying that there are um, Hindu extremist groups calling or pushing for genocide against Muslims. There's about a hundred million uh, Muslims in India. And they were claiming that Prime Minister Modi was not doing enough to silence uh, those voices. There were also uh, tangential uh, claims that uh, Christians are being discriminated against. And there are all sorts of interreligious tensions going on. And, the language used in those articles that came out with the, uh, within a few weeks of each other, you know, a, lot, a number of them in a short time period was remarkably similar. And it's, uh, it seemed that we in, they interviewed the same types of uh, people for those articles and uh, came to the same conclusion. And then all of a sudden there was nothing. Uh, there was this spurt of information and, uh, you know, if it, to me, if someone is really alarmed about a potential genocide, they won't just stop writing about it, but it seems that, that, that that's where it all ended. Can you explain what exactly is the reality, what's going on? I'm sure there's always going to be some level of tensions when you have huge populations of any, of any background living together, but what, what prompted those particular articles? Who is behind them? Why do we see this strange tendency? And I've seen some some people who, with fair amount of interest in Hindu-Muslim relations, kind of pick up on this and uh, kind of buy into this simply because so many publications were writing about it at the same time. Well, firstly, Irina, what I'll tell you is that I'm proud uh, to be from India, which is, of course, a secular country, uh, you know, where Hindus, the Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Jains, everyone is treated equally as per the constitution and as per the law. And uh, I have, you know, uh, many Muslims, Sikh, Christian friends, we interact daily, we eat together. And this is the reality, uh, which perhaps some people cannot digest. And that's why in the annual religious, uh, you know, report that comes out from the US, uh, there are concerns that are raised on India. There are concerns raised on uh, what's been happening in India. Even the smallest of incidents are hyped to a great extent, but they will never talk about their own problems. They will never talk about the white supremacists. They will not talk about the Antifa or, you know, other uh, movements or the clashes that happen in, of course, uh, United States. They will also not talk about, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, the uh, police officers 
uh, of different states in the United States actually target the black and actually have you know concerns uh, which are much deep rooted between them. We've seen recently towards the end of uh, you know Trump's era and the beginning of Biden the kind of protests and street violence that we saw all across the United States. Did we see the same kind of coverage in international press or condemnation? I don't think so. Uh, so in India, ever since 2002, where the Gujarat riots took place, unfortunately, many members of the Muslim community and many members of the Hindu community died in those clashes in Godhra, in Ahmedabad, in uh, you know different cities of uh, Gujarat. Uh, and Narendra Modi was the chief minister of Gujarat at that time who is currently India's prime minister for the second term running. So there's been a hatred, not just on in a uh, section of the press in India, but globally as well, that how can such a person who was the chief minister when these riots happened, so he should take the responsibility for it. So ever since a class of politicians, activists, journalists have been vehemently opposed to the idea of him being the prime minister. So they couldn't stop him politically, democratically. So there's this propaganda campaign ever since that has been happening, uh, not just in India, but all across the globe. Uh, and it's not just restricted to Gujarat, it's restricted uh, nowhere. I mean, there are all kinds of issues that are looked into deeply from Kashmir to Gujarat to other issues, just like you mentioned, that I would perhaps say that more Christians or Sikhs or Hindus are killed in Pakistan than in India, uh, you know, in any kind of a street violence or riots that happen. Uh, but we will not see any kind of a condemnation globally of what's been happening in Pakistan. I'll give you an example. You know, when the 370 was abrogated uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, it, of course, became a huge issue because India had taken such a huge step in history, changing the dynamics completely. And, of course, the Internet was shut as well uh, of entire Jammu and Kashmir, which became a huge problem. Uh, but there were propaganda pieces against India written uh, in New York Times, in Washington Post, in uh, BBC, Al Jazeera, and others, which said that this is discriminatory, which said that this is uh, completely not just, not realizing that it was the Indian parliament which had done this. You know, Indian parliament, which has different political parties, all of them supported it and did it. It was constitutionally done. So how it is illegal? And if it is illegal, why don't you go to the Supreme Court of India and challenge it legally instead of doing these propaganda pieces, calling out not just the government, but a section of people, uh, you know, who actually wanted equality in Jammu and Kashmir. So while these propaganda pieces were happening, I got a call from a channel uh, in the Middle East, Al Jazeera. And they told me, uh, because I was criticizing the international press, that they want to interview me and they will give me equal space. And I spoke to them at length for an hour. And I expected if I spoke to them for an hour, at least they'll give me four to five minutes in their entire program. And I spoke about how there was no terrorism, uh, you know, in the months running after the abrogation of Article 370 in Kashmir. There was no violence. There was no terrorism. There was no fresh recruitment of terrorists happening. But none of this was aired. Just a 30-second clip of mine was aired on in this Al Jazeera news report and a documentary. So you can imagine uh, the kind of bias, uh, the kind of hatred that continuously happens in uh, this uh, entire problem. So this has been a huge challenge uh, for the government here to counter this disinformation, to counter this kind of propaganda that's been happening uh, for years together. Uh, we've seen uh, this happening and it's not just uh, because I'm a journalist, I see how things uh, happen. Uh, there are NGOs that are involved, unfortunately, all across. Uh, and of course, we also see, uh, you know, other organization, Islamist groups that are in fact, uh, uh, sorry for this, they're also involved in this entire uh, manner. So uh, there are Islamist NGOs and groups that are involved in US who continuously fund news organizations and tell them uh, to report a certain way. There are lobbying agencies and lobby groups uh, that are used. There is of course the use of the Pakistan embassy, uh, not just to the United States, but also uh, in fact to uh, the UN uh, that are involved. I'll tell you, a few years uh, back, I was doing an investigation where I spoke to uh, a person named Gulam Nabi Fai, uh, who is based in the United States and claims to be an activist of Kashmiri origin. And uh, I, this was an investigation. Uh, so I was using a spy camera, a spy phone, 
uh, and I posed as a separatist and I spoke with him and he spoke to me at length and he thought actually that I'm a separatist re related to a very prominent separatist in Kashmir. So this Gulam Nabi Fai spoke to me from US and he spoke to me about his ties with the Pakistan ambassador. He spoke to me how Maliha Lodi, who was known as a woman close to the Pakistan army, uh, was funding them. She spoke of how, he spoke of how he had deep relations with the Kashmiri radical separatists and the Pakistan deep state and how he was organizing protests against India on US soil. He spoke about how, uh, you know, India is gaining more prominence and has close ties with US and at the Capitol Hill with congressmen and several representatives, but Pakistan has to do much more than what it is already in terms of funding and resources. And you'd be surprised, the same Gulam Nabi Fai almost 15 years ago was arrested by the FBI for espionage uh, at the behest of the Pakistan government illegally on US soil. And he was imprisoned, uh, you know, finally there was a lot of pressure from the Pakistan government so uh, a plea deal was reached between Gulam Nabi Fai and the US government and the FBI. And finally, he served a minimum sentence in a uh, US prison and finally was released. And once he was released, he was again on the same uh, plank and he was again on the same agenda uh, campaigning for the Pakistan deep state and uh, working at the behest of the Pakistan government uh, to not just spy, but do these propaganda rallies outside the White House, outside uh, the United Nations and campaign against India. So I'm just giving you one example of somebody who confessed before me of what he's doing at the behest of Pakistan, the propaganda that happens. But otherwise, there have been reports uh, uh, that have come in time and again of how lobbying efforts uh, from Pakistan, from Islamist NGOs, etc., happen continuously against India. I mean, in the most recent times, the disinformation has become has become a major challenge, um, not just for India, but US and several others. The use of social media uh, by propaganda, you know, trolls, et, et cetera, to damage reputations, to damage, uh, you know, peace uh, in, in areas. So this is a major challenge, which will remain uh, in, the, in the days ahead. I mean, it's not just wars, it's not just weapons, it's not just, uh, you know, borders where problems are. The more problems now, which I see, will be in the form of cybersecurity and disinformation campaign. So this question that you asked me about the kind of propaganda that happens against India, I think the Indian government is used to it and used to tackling it. Um, and of course, there is there are media reports also that come in. And currently, uh, I would end with this. There's a huge hijab controversy that's happening in India. I'm sure you would have seen in news media. Yeah. Uh, in the southern part of India, in Karnataka, where uh, there's a sudden uh, ruling by the government saying that uh, all students from different religions should be treated equally in school, in uh, educational institutions. And so no hijab will be allowed, no saffron shawls will be allowed to the Hindus, no hijab to the Muslims, and uh, no, nothing else to the others as well. So uh, there's a huge protest that is happening between the Muslims and the Hindus. Muslims saying that hijab should be allowed, uh, even though Quran does not speak about it. And the Hindus saying that if they wear a hijab, then we will have a saffron shawl just to protest as a mark of protest against it. So uh, the court, the high court, if Karnataka is looking into it, uh, the biggest bench, full bench is hearing it perhaps by Monday, there could be some kind of a ruling. But at this moment, what we are seeing is that a huge clash is erupting. And in that as well, we're seeing foreign elements who are continuously using disinformation, saying that Muslims are being killed. We've recently seen an, uh, you know, a statement that has come in from Pakistan Prime Minister's religi religious affairs advisor, uh, Tahir Ashraf, Maulana Tahir Ashraf, in which he says that uh, uh, on Friday, uh, you know, there will be a huge protest uh, in Pakistan as a solidarity day with Indian Muslims. So he's trying to instigate the Indian Muslims and trying to divide the Indian society. Uh, the Pakistan government time and again has also said that we support the Indian Muslims and there's a discrimination against ha happening against them. So media, social media, et cetera, are being used as propaganda tools, unfortunately. So I think we'll have to be careful, uh, especially because you know India is not like a Hindu Republic or an Islamic Republic. We are a secular country. We have to give equal rights to each and every person. And if there are concerns actually uh, from any community or any religion that have to be looked into. And I'm sure 
Uh, we have a robust democracy and robust judicial system as well, where you know the courts can come in anytime the government actually does not deliver justice, uh, etc. But there's an immense level of propaganda that's happening internally and externally, and that has been time and again exposed by different, uh, you know, disinformation groups um, of uh, anti-disinformation groups who actually challenge them and say that how you know there are troll accounts that uh, come in from different countries uh, targeting India. And finally, you know, I personally had an example very recently in the month of November last year. I received threats uh, from a group called ISIS Kashmir for my reportage on Jammu and Kashmir and internal security. And uh, of course, I filed a, a formal complaint with the Indian security agencies and they looked into it. And the IP address and the trace of the origin of this ISIS Kashmir came in from Pakistan in Karachi. So uh, there wasn't any kind of an ISIS that was threatening me, but it was the ISI, the Pakistan uh, you know, intelligence agency. Uh, so they use these, uh, you know, I would say uh, in, in, in Sharad, the Sharad of different groups or different people, uh, but it's actually the Pakistan ISI and others who actually threaten or try to uh, play this kind of a deception, lies and deception to divide people, to have formed some kind of a perception. So we've seen this all through and perhaps uh, many people can see through uh, this agenda and disinformation as well. And perhaps um, uh, we'll unfortunately see a much more of this because uh, in, in, in today's day and age where social media is so much active and unfortunately leads to both positive and negative developments, perhaps negative more, uh, we'll have to see how disinformation is actually countered, not just in India, but all across the globe because disinformation is certainly posing as a huge, huge challenge. Uh, I'll tell you some examples of what I've seen. Uh, first, first of all, some of these uh, quote-unquote genocide people, as I call them, uh, have organized hearings in Congress at various points in time, not with this specific campaign, but in the past, they've organized anti-Indian hearings, exploiting uh, certain friendly members of the US Congress who were open to these uh, perspectives. And um, it's true that those hearings are generally narrow and based on whoever is interested in, in in hearing it which is usually the same types of people but sometimes they they get as high as a full congressional committee hearings and that's when it gets a little bit more serious um the other issue is that there is no statistical data available to an average viewer of some article you know whoever reads times of israel uh, Washington Post, the readers tend to be, it's a relatively small segment of population of uh, highly educated, politically involved, uh, generally left-leaning, but sometimes center-left. Um, and they're not, people like that are not generally going to go and do independent research on how many, uh, first of all, none of those articles generally provide st statistics or data who is actually calling for alleged genocide, how many of these people are there compared to the total population in any given area? What action has already been taken? You don't see any of that follow up. And generally the sources either anonymous or a few people out of however many millions, you, um, they don't generally report on inquiries that they've been done to the Indian government or local government, local authorities. We don't really see anything other than the actual fact of grievance from an unknown number of sources. There's a very difficult way for anyone to formulate an opinion other than a sense of alarm from several clearly organized campaigns. But uh, but to me, it sounds like a campaign, but to somebody else it may seem, well, if New York Times wrote it and then Washington Post wrote it, and, um, and then some TV station CNN reported and it, it must be that there is something there, otherwise all these people would not be following up on each other. Of course, over time, if you see, you know, five articles on the same subject and a month later, there is nothing to me, it sounds like it was a burst of a campaign, but most people don't think about it. All they've seen is they remember the headline, oh, possibility of genocide in India and it's horrible and, and that's all they see. So there is no data available and the other issues I understand what you just said that uh, there is a there are groups uncovering this information, but I don't know. I personally have no idea who those groups are. If they aim at Indian population themselves, that certainly does not reach 
you know, Europe does not visit the United States, it's aimed at India. And of course, if the aim of those groups is to sow discontent in foreign circles to create anti-Indian political sentiment among politically active people, then, you know, to prevent that, they need to have tools to, at the very least, see the other side of the story. I don't see that happening. After those articles in the media, I didn't see some prominent Indian Muslim leader write an article in English to Washington Post disclaiming uh, these rumors and saying that there's nothing, there's no there there. It's just, you know, it's just, it's disinformation or it's a very small number of people and it's not relevant and it's never going to happen. So, so those type of, um, I also did not see a hearing from a, you know, pro-India group challenging whatever hearings uh, that have taken place by the anti-India, let's say, groups pushing for this pro-discrimination narrative in Congress. So when you're seeing kind of a lopsided effect, the question is, you know, okay, maybe maybe everybody, not, not, no one is really concerned, but you see over time, these things can have effect. Support for the war in Yemen in the US has been eroded by consistent lobbying by certain groups against the war and a lack of persistent uh, pushback by, by the parties interested in maintaining US support or clearly one side did a much better job than the other. Um, so similarly here, if you keep hearing information from one, one side, no matter how inaccurate and weak it may be, it will still have an effect. How do you counter something like that? Well, that is the whole question. You know, we do contest, we do respond, we do counter, but unfortunately, it doesn't have the same kind of impact with this, uh, you know, propaganda already has. You know, time and again, if you observe the kind of reports that we have seen in Washington Post or New York Times, and the kind of counters that come from different Indian groups, either the Indian diaspora or the Indian think tanks or the Indian even government representatives, or even Indian journalists or other speakers, either on social media or through different uh, platforms, it is not reported as much uh, in, of course, the United States. So unfortunately, we've seen this systematic campaign uh, over the years. And as you rightly pointed out, this has a huge impact. It might not have an immediate impact, but over the years, over the months, it has a huge impact, at least on the psyche of people of who uh, are manipulated over a period of time about a particular issue, including Kashmir. I remember when I was in Kashmir, uh, I was, when I was in the United States, and often I was asked about Kashmir and I uh, tried to speak about it. I was uh, invited by the US State Department uh, for a, a fellowship. We were in Washington, DC and Iowa, and we were, of course, uh, uh, four Indians and three Pakistanis. So out of the three Pakistanis, two were uh, you know, members of their parliament. And uh, every time I saw, uh, you know, their meeting happening, this is the level of propaganda that, you know, you'll understand. Every time you, they saw uh, an opportunity, they met, of course, uh, uh, representatives and congressmen and others. Uh, and of course, we had no political discussion. We had no discussion on Kashmir or India-Pakistan conflict or any of that. But every time a meeting ended, uh, there was a video that they uh, captured of themselves and while speaking about the meeting. And they said that we raised the Kashmir issue in US with this certain congressman, with this certain representative. And immediately that video was not just uploaded on social media and given to their leaders and others in Pakistan, but was shared with the US press as well. And they every time spoke about how they raised the Kashmir issue with this certain politician on US soil. So this is the kind of disinformation and hypocrisy that often is seen. And similarly, the US media backs such claims without fact checking, without looking at whether this is the right kind of information. I mean, uh, as journalists, we are initially taught of lo looking into what, why, how, and when of things. But today, unfortunately, you know, if there is money involved, if there are TRPs that are involved, viewership that is involved of a certain propaganda, then blindly, unfortunately, these news organizations indulge in it. And unfortunately, uh, while the world, of course, uh, the groups want to speak about Islamophobia, but unfortunately, when I see today, uh, when, when it comes to India, there's a Hindu phobia uh, that has creeped in in the US media and the Western press. 
uh, who, whenever it comes to India, when it, uh, it comes to Hindus, have been completely biased, have been completely uh, not just in their reportage. They speak about a genocide. You know, for the last 20 years, I've been hearing that India is on the brink of a genocide that's happening. I mean, where's the genocide? Where are these killings happening? Why don't you report about the facts? If there is indeed a genocide, you know, I have suffered ethnic cleansing in Kashmir. So I would be the first person to, uh, you know, have empathy uh, as a human to human, uh, accept that fact and have empathy with that certain section or group who, who might be suffering a genocide. So where is that genocide that's happening? Where is that carnage that you're talking about so happily in the editorials of New York Times and Washington Post? I don't see that happening. I mean, with uh, even the hijab controversy, I completely agree. I mean, India is a democracy. We believe in dissent and we believe in different opinions coming together. And, you know, there can be a mechanism of working out things. But this does not mean that people are being killed or people are dying or their rights have been crushed and uh, curtailed completely. That's absurd. That's wrong. That's misinformation. And U.S. press, and time and again, I use the word Washington Post and New York Times and their friends in UK and elsewhere have been guilty of blindly looking at mis misinformation, pushing the narrative against India when it comes to Kashmir, when it comes to Indian government, when it comes to the Hindu people of uh, India. And there's a complete Hindu phobia that's uh, creeped in in their system. Uh, they do not want to uh, positively report on the positive sides. Now, I'm not even ex ex uh, expecting them to report on the positives, but whatever concerns that you have, at least do a just reportage, at least report facts about situations when it, there is a hijab controversy. Why don't you mention that, you know, Quran does not mention hijab. It's not like a religious diktat that you have to. These are the Islamic preachers who have over the years uh, doing, uh, you know, uh, translation of uh, hadith and others saying that uh, the women or the girls need to wear hijab. They need to cover up and that to, to stay away from the male gaze. And this is discriminatory. I mean, in the world of 2022, uh, there is a campaign happening online right now that the woman should have a right to wear a hijab. I mean, this is shocking. Aren't you seeing visuals of what's happening in Iran? Aren't you seeing the discrimination that every time a woman, uh, you know, protests on standing on a car on the streets of Iran and say that I don't want to wear this hijab. If I remove this hijab, I'll be sent to 24 years in prison, but I'll still do this protest. I mean, do you... Uh, actually support oppression? Do you support discrimination? Do you support the subjugation of women that's happening in the Afghanistan of Taliban uh, over the last six months? So this is absolutely absurd and shocking that at a time when Iran, women in Iran are protesting against the Islamic regime, when women in Afghanistan are protesting against the Taliban terrorists uh, who are Pakistani puppets, when women in Saudi Arabia also are trying to convince the royal family that let's evolve, in, involve women in, you know, somewhere, have given them rights, give them at least driving rights that happened recently a couple of years ago. And when Saudi, Saudi Arabia and other Muslim countries are looking towards having rights, having some kind of modern ideas in their uh, very orthodox mindset, in India, there is unfortunately a certain section and supported by US press uh, who say that, Hijab should be a right. Hijab should be given to girls and women and they should wear it. So I personally believe that hijab is a symbol of oppression. Yes, I completely agree that women should have the right. If they want to wear a hijab, they should wear it. But is it really a choice? We'll have to take that call. Is it really a choice? Because the mindset that they have grown into, where they've been told that if they do not wear a hijab, it is un-Islamic. It is against the Quran. It is against the basic principles of Islam, which is a complete lie. And they've been grown into a system where they say that if you do not wear a hijab or a burqa or uh, you know other dresses that are prescribed at, by these mullahs or Islamic preachers, then you'll be an outcast. You'll be boycotted by the society. Worse, you could be even stoned or even boycotted by your family and society. So where is the freedom of choice that we are talking about? Which the uh, you know New York Times and Washington Post very famously and in they are romant romanticizing this idea of wearing a hijab. So this is absolutely shocking that when world is looking towards liberal ideas, you know, opening up, 
uh, people are getting together. The world is getting smaller. They're connecting with each other. And even the worst uh, Islamic societies who have been completely, women have been chained and imprisoned. They are now talking about a situation where hijab is a right. Hijab is seen as a, uh, you know, a symbol of equality. I mean, are you kidding me? This is the shocking aspect that has come to the light. I do hope that the courts of India take a very just call, which does not ruin uh, the education. I mean, education is the primary responsibility that we need to give equally to all our children. Does not matter from which religion, caste, creed, etc. But to have this systematic campaign where you say that hijab is a freedom of choice is shocking, not true, and completely absurd. No, it's certainly not a choice for children. They do what their parents tell them. So I would say that minors don't have a choice, as a matter of fact. What I find strange is they don't report that the controversy is not just about hijabs, but also about any types of head covering for anybody. Yeah. And that makes this whole situation into a disinformation campaign. Um, I wonder, is it a coincidence that the genocide narrative is being pushed just as China is coming under criticism for, for the Uyghur genocide, which not everyone has even acknowledged fully in these publications, have not have really underplayed? Do you think that there is also an element of China's outreach or sympathy from these publications to kind of try to distract from the issue or to create a perception of equality between China and India in that respect, because many people are pushing for economic shift to India from China as a result of these and other policies and issues. Do you think that there is a large geopolitical um, situation playing out than simple bias of short-sighted, uh, ideologically biased publications? Do you think there is a, a more serious campaign here? Absolutely right, Merida. You know, uh, I mentioned information warfare, and information warfare is the biggest tool right now of uh, war, of sabotage that's happening. And it's not just with India, China, and others. It's with all the countries. I mean, look at US and Russia. Uh, look at uh, what's happening between Russia and Ukraine and the NATO. So information warfare has been used time and again to sabotage, to give a different perception, to completely, you know, have this kind of a, kind of a garb. Uh, a new narrative that has developed. And that's why we've seen China using not just social media, uh, but their press and perhaps other press as well. They might be secretly funding, who knows, uh, a systematic campaign against India. And uh, this is be happening prominently in US publication. I mean, there have been several examples where uh, <clears throat> China, China has been seen funding, uh, you know, reportage and uh, such propaganda against India, against US uh, for that matter as well. So. Uh, of course, this is not wrong at all. This has been happening time and again. Uh, China has been using information warfare, not just cyber warfare and others uh, against India. Of course, uh, their own in, in China, of course, as you know, there's no freedom of press. There are no free publications. All the media organizations that are in China are under the CCP, the Chinese Communist regime. And uh, be it Global Times, be it uh, you know China Daily, or Xenua or others, they're all, uh, you know, uh, reading transcripts or scripts that are given to them by the communist uh, regime. So uh, there's a complete uh, information warfare that happens at the behest of China. And you're very right that the genocide that the world actually acknowledged and talked about against the Uyghurs in China, the Uyghur Muslims, and the atrocities that are being committed by the Chinese communist regime against them, the genocidal camps the kind of visuals, the videos, and the reportage that has come out of it has shocked the world. And China is trying to completely be blatant about it and does not care uh, about any kind of a, you know, equality, justice, or any kind of a response to these reports that have come in. They've always uh, sidetracked, they have rubbished such reports. And of course, there's no question of any kind of a justice or a glimmer of hope uh, for these Yugan Muslims, unfortunately. And as I said, the Islamic world has remained a mute spectator to the condition of Yugan Muslims. And to divert attention from what's happening in China, be it in Hong Kong, be it with the Yugan Muslims, or be it with the Tibetans, or even the China-Taiwanese relations, China is smartly trying to not just divide India, 
but uh, instigate uh, Muslims, instigate passions. And as I said, who knows, uh, have a systematic propaganda campaign against India through the Western press, where uh, there are no facts, there are no figures, there are no statistics from ground, but continuously uh, a propaganda uh, against a country, its government, its people. And as I said, Hindu phobia as well, where it's seen like, you know, the Hindu majority in India is killing its minorities, which is not the truth. Uh, the truth is that India is a secular country and just like any other country, we have our problems. And I condemn when any, any lynching happens against a minority or, you know, if at all there are Muslims who are suffering, there is a system of justice, system of democracy that has precedent, precedence over anything. But if these propaganda disinformation campaigns continuously happen, that's not going to change the narrative in any way. Of course, it's going to be a huge security problem uh, for the security apparatus of the country. And I'm sure uh, perhaps they will have mechanisms to deal with it. But you are absolutely right that I completely suspect Chinese involvement in these uh, fake media reports, disinformation and misinformation against India. Now, if that is the case, that would represent a new escalation in China's China from being neutral in the kind of uh, allowing, for instance, Pakistan to sponsor Islamist extremists to China colluding with the uh, pro-Qatar, for instance, individuals such as some of the journalists who are writing for these publications who are known to also publish heavily in Qatari publications with the exactly types of narratives that you mentioned uh, from Al Jazeera. If that is the case, that the communist part, Chinese communist party's collusion with Qatar, collusion with Qatar a propaganda machine and these types of pro-Islamist narratives kind of shatters the image of China as a secularist, anti-extremist power uh, that can be counted on as a neutral broker and that countries can turn to uh, for trade negotiations without, um, without it telling them what to do with their own countries, especially uh, Muslim majority states like Saudi Arabia and UAE, which have suffered from Islamist groups and who are now growing closer to China as well as to India, this might be a warning to them. Um, if China is actually growing closer to these Islamist groups, it is not a neutral power. It is in fact will allow a level of meddling into their internal affairs by their proxies uh, just while it's doing business with them. And in the long run, it will do political damage. I fear so. I mean, in the long, or long run, it could do political damage, the collusion uh, between the Islamists, uh, between, of course, China, Pakistan, and as you said, uh, Qatar and the deep state and uh, Al Jazeera and others. That has been completely exposed now. I mean, this has been used against India time and again. We've seen systematic campaigns, news reportage, uh, disinformation that has happened. And, you know, one thing that we did not speak about is of course, Afghanistan, which is a new fertile ground mm -hmm. uh, for the Islamist terror organizations, not just in the region, but from across the globe. So this is also posing as a major challenge. And this comes, uh, you know, at a time when Pakistan is at its worst, the radicals and the Islamists in Pakistan are, you know, almost in power. Uh, Imran Khan and the Pakistan deep state, the army are supporting them. The Chinese involvement in Pakistan is at its peak. The Chinese regime also met Mullah Baradar and others uh, of the Pakistani Taliban and are trying to seek close association with them and you know invest in the new Taliban's Afghanistan. So we'll see more of this uh, you know systematic campaign where uh, you know Islamists are growing closer to both Pakistan and as well as China. And uh, only the time will tell how we will be able to deal with such kind of situation. Uh, the Al Qaeda and the ISIS are also very active in the region. Uh, we've seen not just the Taliban. We saw uh, during the when Kabul fell and the U.S. was trying to evacuate people, how the bomb blast happened, and the ISIS uh, was held responsible. But we'll have to see ISIS in the context of Afghanistan. You know, ISIS, ISIS Khorasan province, which is uh, of people, the disgruntled elements from the Taliban, from Pakistan and Al Qaeda. So the root cause of the problem remains same, uh, which is Pakistan, where, uh, uh, you know, until now, the Al-Qaeda 
and the ISIS and the Pakistani Taliban has have found uh, shelter, have found home uh, for a very long time, as per, of course, the U.S. State Department, as per the U.N. and others, fact checkers. And now Afghanistan, with the close funding of Pakistan, China, and of course, association with Taliban, will become the new fertile ground of these Islamist organizations. So the Islamist radicalization and the terrorists will only become, you know, at its peak. And that's why we see the U.S. homeland security just about a week ago increasing the threat assessment after a very long time, saying that a group of people or a group uh, of people could be attacked at any time. And over the last 24 hours or 48 hours, we've seen two major bomb threats that have happened in Washington, D.C., uh, where even the first, second gentleman was rescued from a school, public school. So, uh, you know, this is a growing concern. Uh, the association of Islamist groups with Pakistan, China, and of course, the use of disinformation, where of course, there are elements uh, in the US that became pawns in the entire process. And when I say pawns, the US media of all becomes the biggest pawn in this entire process because they become the medium which are giving voice to the Islamist, to the, you know, uh, China and Pakistan as well. And may, might I remind you that before Kabul fell, a few months before that, Sirajuddin Haqqani, who has been involved with the worst terror attacks against US, against, uh, uh, you know, uh, co common people in Afghanistan and in Pakistan as well, wrote an editorial, invited editorial article in the New York Times. Can you imagine a global terrorist who has a bounty on his head, who, whose face has not been seen ever uh, till date by the US or Pakistan or anybody in the world, is get space uh, inside the New York Times. So this uh, is telling. This uh, perhaps reveals the reality of the time that we live in, where through money, through propaganda, and through uh, the connivance and the collusion of China, Pakistan, and the Islamists now in Afghanistan, where US was fooled completely, the Biden administration, and before that Trump were completely fooled by Pakistan, uh, are only more active. And so uh, very interestingly, we'll have to see because these problems are only going to escalate further down on ground in Afghanistan and in the form of disinformation, uh, not just against India, but against the United States as well. Well, the first step to solving any problem is acknowledging it. And the second step is having the tools to at least start formulating uh, inform to, to start inf getting the correct information before going to even the, uh, being able to formulate coherent policies. I hope to see more resources from India shared with Western with, with, the, with the Western countries because right now uh, the dominant voices on these topics are not people such as yourself, but local, uh, journalists well known to the public, like the Washington Post reporter that we all know, um, and the New York Times uh, and their New York Times counterparts and other people of that sort. These are the voices that are currently dominating the narrative at the very least average people and, and even not average, uh, fairly involved people need to have easily accessible alternatives to at the very least start raising questions about these narratives. Right now, that's just not widely available and you have to hunt and search for them to even get the conversation going. I'm glad that we we were able to start this discussion. It certainly does not uh, cover everything, but it's a start and I hope to 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 continue to, to talk more about India and its role in the region in the future. There are many more issues to be discussed other than propaganda, fortunately, but, but it is an issue that will not go away. Thank you so much for sharing your views, sharing your experiences and sharing these valuable insights that we would not normally get. We, um, the Washington Outsider has a publication where we welcome also articles from various voices, particularly on ones that are not represented, widely represented in the mainstream media. So you are always welcome to contribute or to uh, share with your colleagues if anyone wishes to pass on anything with us. And, Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, this was uh, the Washington Outsider Report on the Coalition uh, Radio with Aditya Raj Kapoor uh, from India, uh, discussing disinformation and funding of extremism 
uh, issues pertaining to India's growing global role and challenging it. Um, we will be back again at our usual time, uh, Tuesday nights, 9 p.m. Washington Outsider Report with the uh, Editor-in-Chief Irina Tsukaman. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. That was, that was great. Thank you so much for your perspective. Wonderful. Great to be here. So this will be um, telecast on Tuesday, is it? Um, yes, it's usually shared Tuesday. Um, we will this one will be probably be shared as a quote unquote special episode uh, later later today. Unlike Al Jazeera, we do not censor our speakers. So the full <laughs> episode will be available on YouTube as, as soon as it's, whether today or tomorrow, whenever, once it's available, I'll, I'll, I'll of course share it with you. All right, glad, glad to be here. Thank you so much, Reina. Thank you.